history in architecture, but more than that, um, have created architectural discourse, have been incredibly supportive of younger architects, younger students, all their lives. My task is not going to be to show how great they are, because everyone knows how great they are. So what I am going to do is essentially give you a little glimpse on how I um, saw their first work, where they started, what an amazing uh, coincidence that these two have such similarities or not. And um, I think also what is really interesting is that they both came up with the title The Seven Lives of the Architect. And then the other title which are combined into Who Would Have Thought? And Who Would Have Thought is going to be part of what we're going to be discussing as well. Some fun facts. Morphosis Architects was founded in 1972 by Tom Bain and later Michael Rotondi. But not only did they start an office, they also started a school called Cyber. The name of the firm came directly from the Greek word morphosis, meaning to form or be in formation. I want you guys to come up with a good question. So, start with Co Kimmelblau, 1968, very similar time, was founded by Wolf Briggs. Helmut Wyszynski and Michael Bolso in Vienna, Austria. The second studio was opened in 88 in LA. And Wolf Briggs was more than 20 years the Briggs studio in the Angoan in Vienna, but he also ran uh, that architecture institute uh, since 2003, as well as he was a vice chancellor of the university until recently. So not only have they both always had an office, they also always have been really instrumental in academia. So what what did they start with? You know, I I remember as a student, and I'm obviously from a different generation than you guys, um, that this blew us away, right? And this was the blazing wing. Architecture must blaze, burn maybe. 15 meters high, weighed one and a half tons, and was developed to be fueled by liquid gas burners. The way they grew was also very indicative of the way they thought. In Kohl-Himmelblau's case, the office of the Wolf Bricks, the drawing was an intuitive drawing, and it was really instrumental in the way they thought. Um, intuitive drawing was a method they developed very early on, and they stated then, in that period around the 70s, recently, in the 70s, since about 78, we have begun, without knowing where to lead us, to condense and shorten the time of the design process. That is to talk in length about the project, but without ever thinking of the tangible, spatial consequences of that project. And then, all of a sudden, there is a drawing on the wall, on the table, on paper, somewhere. So this project is one of the first projects I know of Coca-Cola Pinot Blanc, The Blazing Wing that was instrumental for the way we were thinking about architecture then. Tomé actually pos posited this really well. He said to me the other day, we were artists that made architecture. So not architects that made art. You have to really understand that difference. We were artists that made architecture. <laughs> and this is cool. It's a pity that sounds wrong, but it's in German. So, you know, that in itself. That means uh, forever young. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So in that time, um, I remember as a very young student in Holland, um, I traveled down in my Gershu. Oh, some people know what that is. It's a supermarket that's kind of very floppy, but sometimes made from linen and kind of very thin metal. Uh, I drove down to the south of Holland, mortified. I was, uh, I had heard that Wolf Briggs was giving a lecture went to talk to him, heard the lecture, was even more mortified, gathered my courage to the end of the lecture, went over to him and said, listen, we're coming in a month with a bunch of students from Holland, and we would like to see your work. And he's like, just call me when you 
bar kind of um, culture space. The, this, this was one of their projects, uh, and after that day, we felt like our world had changed. Our idea of what was possible had changed, our idea of how you should handle yourself as your architect had changed. And what I find very beautiful is that the essence of that work is still part of the drive, although changed and definitely innovated and changed, there, there is still, this is 2009, you still see traces of that first strong impulse of the relationship of drawing to the object in their work. Now, we're moving on, we're moving to LA, 1985. There is a restaurant in LA, and the client came up with a question to Marcus's. Can I have a roadside steakhouse for the future with pop? I mean, honestly, good, good commission, I would say. So basically, they started working on that. But what I find really beautiful is that the idea of being an artist, creating architecture, in both cases, really expressed itself in the way they were also producing their drawings. And I think the drawings expressed a very clear complexity, way of thinking, um, understanding space in different ways, understanding possibilities in different ways, and potentially seeing the drawing as generative of something else. And then, of course, the, the restaurant uh, got started the, the residence itself was um, located in Beverly Hills in California. It became a theater for observing and scoring this cult of personality. It was part of a strategy that unites discrete elements of the building, the fresco, and the sculpture into a single framework. Part of the core of that project was a serious, <laughs> overwhelming object called the conceptual orrery which descends dramatically from a large oculus at the far end of the wall, and it expresses the reflective or interpretive intention of the project. Connected to a sundial on the roof, as its other extreme, it seems to power a stylus poised at the ground in act of etching, inscribing an image of the building and the sculpture itself. This is a project in a similar time, again, a very strong object in the middle of the space, almost generating the space around itself, as well as generating itself, at the Little Texas Center in LA, <coughs> and a shop in uh, LA at Lane Mass. I think what is really important is not only that these people had a very specific way of working, but they also were all talking about it as a team, internationally. So shortly after, in 1989, they decided to work together on a competition for an arts park Arts Basically, a dense cluster of uh, cultural facilities in the peripheral part of Los Angeles. Uh, Marcus is, as the LA office invited Colton um, Club to work with them. And again, you can see the expression of the drawing is an essential part of the project. And it creates more than just the project, it creates the atmosphere, it creates the mood, and it creates Actually, Kipnis talks a lot about this, right? The mood of the project. Um, but it also starts to be generative really more, of maybe a new city, a new architecture, a new space. So I, I would like to really leave it at the very beginning of their careers in order for them to go back to the future and to talk about what their concerns are now. Everything in between we know, and I like to, you know, for me, I like to position this beginning aspect because I think it's really important for what is coming later. Uh, but I would ask, really love to hear from them what they think uh, is back to the future, what their current concerns and obsessions are, and how they see themselves. So they're going to both frame the dialogue really briefly, after which we'll have a uh, discussion uh, first maybe between them uh, and definitely also with you. So I would like to ask Tommy to uh, start the discussion. You can do that there if you like. Um, it's really interesting looking 
at your, your rooftop, which I, of course, know well. And that it reminds me, and I'm thinking of you, um, students of architecture that are beginning your career, and will um, begin in a formal sense in some of the studio, on the studio, etc. Um, and, and I look at Wolf's work, and it's occurred to me before, because we've known each other for a few decades. Um, I'm always startled when I see the Wolf Park, and that I realize that he shows up at a very young age completely formed. And it just boggles my mind to look at that work, that there's so much um, the DNA that, that exists for 30 or 40 years after that work is so much of the exhibit in that work. And then I look at the work I'm doing, I'm completely lost. And I'm struggling with pragmatics, and I'm trying to locate architecture in really stupid pragmatic problems that we could get on our studio, little cafes and blah, blah, blah. Right? And, and, and I'm looking for something, and I'm looking at Diderot, and I'm looking at construction, etc. cetera, but I'm totally lost. And it's really, it's going to have something to do with maybe our, 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 our conversation, because we were formed in such different ways. And it's going to be some of it's cultural, he had been in and be in LA. Mm -hmm. And some of it is just the circumstance by which you begin your practice, your thinking, or your conceptualization of what it means to be an architect. And when I say be an architect, I mean uh, building, doing, not talking or thinking, right? Constructing, right? Um, interacting with the world, right? Because that's um, the thinking part, is that's a complete different conversation. It's the interaction for me in this just uh, maintaining your own integrity artistically. But that's the concrete. I'm going to just very quickly discuss something that I think is going to get us reconnected and will have very much to do with um, continuing looking for a direction of architecture. And what I want to do first of all, I think it's important that you, and I'm, again, this is set up for you students of architecture, um, to put it in context. And I'm going to show you a very particular kind of set of ideas I'm interested in, and I'm going to do it in five minutes. And I'm going to quickly just say um, it's in context to um, the work happening at this time in my studio, which takes up 80% of my time, right? So, um, what am I missing? Nothing. Go ahead. I need to get over. Uh, um, uh, a, a tower and, 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 and Senjan. Another one in Casablanca, uh, a, 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 a research center in, in uh, outside of Seoul, Korea. Whoop. Um, a, a border station, New York, uh, a project in Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles, a hotel complex, a, um, an academic building in Florida, a cultural, Korean cultural center in Los Angeles. Um, an art museum in, in, in California, Los Angeles, just started construction. Um, a competition in, in uh, Nanjing. Uh, a very, very large complex, a, uh, in the embassy in Beirut. It's a, uh, it's a kilometer long. It's a billion dollar project. It takes up a huge amount of my kind of effort, uh, et cetera. That's the context I'm working under. And I'm going to now talk about something that kind of connects to that maybe much more and it's going to very much have to do with my interest in beginnings and my focus on chance and an idea of, of an organizational idea that's, that's had to do with the combinatory language, which I've been interested in for X amount of years. And um, five years ago, we were moving our studios, and I had uh, recognized that I hadn't been drawing, I hadn't been doing abstract work for years as I was um, becoming a practicing architect and I was absorbed in my practice. And I, I realized that it was um, something was I was lacking, and it was I was missing um, drawing and construction of drawings is a method of thinking, and it's my major kind of method of thinking. And I was missing that, and I was also missing it as a um, at a psychoanalytical level. I was um, it was incredibly therapeutic, and it was a time I could spend by myself outside of all the contingency that that put your your forced focus as a architecture meaning the day-to-day -day kind of world and how that affects you. And I started drawing again, and I was working with ideas that I'd worked with 20 years ago, but now with a very different kind of sense of possibilities with, with computer and with uh, 
methods of producing interest and complexity and differentiation that I've been fascinated with from very, very early on. And I'm systematizing um, chance behavior. And chance being uh, indeterminacy, contingency, uncertainty, reconciling opposites, um, the unfinished, the openness, and all of it has to do with the continuation of a 20th century project that started with Duchamp and his, his, his three standard um, stoppages and then continues with Rouchet and Pollock and Arp and people like Paul Oster in terms of writing and, and Miles Davis in terms of the uh, improvis improvised work, etc., cetera, et cetera. It all has to do with that kind of an idea. And it's um, trying to organize, it's trying to produce a coherency out of um, chance behavior and finding a, a, a place between chance and, um, and, and willfulness. And um, it very quickly started becoming connected, especially the contingent and the, the, the complexity of the spatial organization, to ideas that were going to connect to this is going to become a park in Beijing. And it became kind of a beginning organizational idea where a very abstract notion starts helping us organize a complex problem. And it has the sectional capabilities that I've been interested in from, um, I think, probably as I was introduced to somewhere between Alto and Usan. If you look, you know that like Usan, the orange book? Just look at the sections. Some of the work is not quite as strong after he got to Hong Kong in Sydney. Um, and there's this direct connection between the ideas conceptually and things that become projects that have to do with the build projects. And there's a, a connection because I'm drawing now with, with intentionality. And the intention is I'm looking for an organizational structure. I'm looking for a, um, coherency. Right? And then what happened, and this is the current one, and I've got two more minutes. Um, I'm taking this work, and I'm now working with AI, AI-like scripting and you're looking at a hundred of these. And I'm dealing with, I'm able to vastly expand the opportunities I'm looking at for any particular problem. I can take another one and do the same thing. And we're taking these now, and I'm now shifting this in terms of various intentions, in terms of edge condition, in terms of the four parts they're made out of, et cetera, et cetera. And it allows me just to expand my options. And then just recently, We've got our first three projects that are being constructed in China today, and they're going to be somewhat large pavilions. They're 60 by 60 cubes that start the idea, and they're coming out of the same notion where I can, I can produce uh, highly differentiated structures that I can control the behavior. I can, be all, I can control chance behavior. And I'm, um, I'm challenging the uh, authenticity of the hand. And I'm also, um, my instinct is that um, what we call intuition somehow wears out. And my sense is 40, 45, or 50, you're losing, most of us, I'll speak for myself, are losing that whatever we call instinct. And I'm looking for an expansion of my, my um, creative kind of opportunities. And to do that, um, I have to understand the nature of the mechanisms that produce the organizations. I become more and more interested in the mechanisms that produce the work vis-a-vis -vis, um, the instinctual kind of sense of that. And then what that does, is, and of course it's, it's dealt with three-dimensionally and not two-dimensionally today, so there's no such thing as plan section elevation. It's all singular. And it's developed singularly, so you, you, you understand inside, outside. You understand the thing as a totality from the very beginning. And then what that gives you, um, the project you're looking at has been developed over three weeks. I can work at the speed of light, and I can look at huge numbers of options. And it's, it's my uh, preoccupation at the moment. <laughs> That's my start. <laughs> Yeah, we, ha we had an agreement that Tom is talking 10 minutes, and I don't have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm still, yeah, 
I'm still <laughs> fascinated by you, Sean, and I'll talk. No, 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 it's okay. I just wanted to explain, and you could see that very clearly why I'm still friend, and deep friendship is uh, connecting us with Tom. I met Tom, it's, it's my version. Okay. <laughs> this, my version is true. <laughs> so, I told, uh, we got the commission, my, my, uh, my, let's say my imagination was always, I want to go to the United States because this must be heaven. Yeah. LA, it must be the greatest place you can imagine because a lot of music comes from there and so forth. So I told Saha that I'm going to LA and she said, okay, you have to visit Morphosis, Eric Moss and Morphosis. And I, I never heard from them before and I said, okay, and I read the address, Stoner Avenue, and I think, oh, that must be great because it reminds me of Rolling Stones, yeah? And I think, so I was sitting in a little hut and in came a giant guy, tall guy, he has to bow down to go through the door. And I had a book in his hand, and the book was, we just published the book, uh, Architecture is Now. And he's the first word, he should, he should have, and blah, blah, blah. And then he said, I like your drawing. And I said, oh, because I informed myself before I went to the skies and I looked at the things they did, I said, this is a great compliment from a guy. I thought he's the greatest graphic artist of the world. Still is, yeah. And you can see that on, on the models and all on his drawings, but very disciplined, very disciplined. In my point of view, I, I thought uh, he has an eye, he is an eye, but the discipline, I don't matter too much. And I still think he is the greatest graphic. He can present his work in a graphic outfit, I would say. No one of my generation is able to do so. So uh, this is one thing, because I admire his work very much. The other thing is, you know, nowadays the theory and the the radical architecture is going like the theory is here, and the radical architecture, or, or the radical realis realism is here, very apart. And sometimes, if I look at the presentation of architects, I see the plans, I see the models, and I hear them speak, and I have the feeling they try to pimp up their projects by using ununderstandable theoretical words. Not in the case of Tom Mann. If he talks in a kind of theoretical, of theoretical approach in his doing, I can read that in the project with no doubt. Words, explanation, and what I can see is connected deeply. This is not common at all. So this is, and I am fascinating because this, you could call it authentic, yeah? And this is a big criticism on the theory right now because they are talking about, they are standing with two feet in the air, yeah? So to say. So, I met Tom. Years later, years later, I had I met him uh, you know, occasionally, uh, lecture or whatever, competition, jury. I told him a story of my experience in Moscow. I cannot tell you the story because it's a me too story. Yeah, and I told him it was very exciting. We laughed a lot, and. Another year, years later, to my birthday, he came to, 
to Berlin, we had a celebration, and he said to me, oh, do you know what happened to me in Moscow? And he told me my story. And I said, Tom, Tom, are you sure this is my story? And he said a very remarkable word, and this is why I love it. He said, oh, sorry, I always confuse confuse reality. So, this is this architecture and I love it. I really love it. And how we are connected, you can see that on the drawing, they are very different, yeah? More the emotional, not controlled psychogram, psychogram of the upcoming project, a very controlled approach, but packed with a lot of power. Both of us, we have one goal, and that comes together, let's say, in a, in a different, different architecture. Yeah, in a different architecture, which could play a role in the future, we don't know, because future is always insecure. But both of us are going via art into architecture, that means, it um, broadens up the point of view. When I was young, I always said, if you only think in architectural terms, only architecture will come out. This was the um, approach we had in 1968 when we formed Cold So and this is also like morphosis. We didn't want to, that people call us, uh, Nixon, Swichinsky, and things like that. We said, we want to be famous and rich, like the musical groups, like the Stones and the Beatles, and, and I could hear the money coming in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm to say, to say, the biggest mistake I made, <laughs> made in my life, believing that, yeah. but it, gave such power, yeah, because one of my role models in architecture, you won't believe it, is Keith Richard. And when I said, okay, Tom, let's talk about Rolling Stone, he, he said, oh, we are getting old now. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, <laughs> we can do that because the students will believe we are old guys. Eh? And I said, okay. What will they think when I, what will you think when I say that I love Johann Sebastian Bach? Am I dead now? No. It does, it does. So I still love the Stones and Bach and Mozart very much so actually and all this modern music and I still love the new one. But it's not that strong. I'm used to hear strong music. This is the difference. And I don't want to discuss it with you. Be happy with your music. Take the advantage out. Like we took out uh, a lot of music. The structure he is talking about. You know, the painting of the guitar, rock guitar is the same emotional impact when we are talking about structure, namely because I hate columns. Columns is the symbol of taking pressure. What I prefer is um, the other one, the pension, pension structure. And this is the same how he is playing guitar, and making up an emotional, uh, adventure for the listener, and if you look at our structures, it's not the same like music, the most stupid thing in architecture. Oh, I don't, I don't want to give a lecture now. I just, I'm happy to sit next to you. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. I would like to go back to my roots to understand why I'm 
like I am. <laughs> Sorry, I have to get into that. Hopefully it's near right. Everybody is right and nothing is correct. 
This was the mood we were in, and still in. Everyone is right, but no one could tell me he is the, the guy he knows, which knows all the things. Space suit, racing cars, rockets, flying in the moon. Yeah, this is why we like, we like, uh, we don't like columns. And this is what we try to, uh, to, uh, to build for a new society. This was the so-called cloud. Pneumatic structures, it's not like amorphosis did. It was a visionary project for no client, but we want to, uh, to state what we want to do if we get a, a project. <laughs> we never got a project at this time, yeah? Movable platforms, the building structure was air. Yeah. And we approached the, the body as a medium, meaning that we wanted to um, extend our body to architecture. And this is to expand media in a third dimension. The helmet was supposed to be like a TV helmet. The West it was connected to uh, the nose smell, and you can, could feel the, uh, the, the, the vest moving according to the program you could see. Actually, this was my diploma work. The professor who uh, did the examination, he was really, really thick, fat. So the vest didn't fit uh, <laughs> very close. And it, 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 it was not good, <laughs> but anyway, action, not building, but action. Foam in a extended um, presence, meaning 1,000 uh, cubic meter in one minute, and uh, detonation triggered by the heartbeat. Anyway, so, and this is what you were talking about, this thing. I have to say that we got a building permit for this. Imagine. And in only two days, tomorrow is yesterday, what are we doing now? Tom, this is something for you. I told you that I'm working on the Brancusi Museum. This is not the Brancusi Museum, it's a museum for bread, we just finished a year ago. But what we did, we thought, okay, the base here is very conventional. What we did, we turned it around, and that will be the museum for Brancusi and young Romanian artists in the middle of the Danube. Anyway, so to define art is the next step. I like this. <laughs> Thank you very much, because Inside of um, Mokap in Shenzhen, it's a big museum for art and architects and whatever. And what I saw is a guy cleaning <laughs> his motorcycle in a modern thing. So anyway, so we are doing a lot of things. City planning. Or redefine the, the top typology of a high rise. It's more or less a vertical city. And I always have an eye on what's happening on the ground floor, because I really hate streets with no name. I really hate the glass facades of the shops, which are not working. And we want to make it very lively all over the things. And this is we're working on right now. It's a, uh, what is it? Um, uh, how do you call it? The Seilbahn? Cable car, yeah. It's connecting Russia with China. This is an opera we are working on right now. It's an opera building in Sebastopol. This is a project we are just, uh, we just won the competition. As you can see, this roof, which is an uh, exhibition space, is 
extended during 100 meters. So this is what we are doing now, city planning. Okay. I'm sorry. Come on, I'm sorry. You shouldn't let me show the things because uh, the rooftop, I have to explain the rooftop. At this time, it was not allowed to change the roof, uh, the angle of the existing roof. You are not, were not allowed to change the material, nothing was allowed. Just making windows into the roof. And I went to the mayor and I explained to him, this is a sculpture. Therefore, no building regulations could be used to get the permit. But, and he said, he was a friendly guy, he said, yes, of course, build it. So this is, no, what I wanted to say, and this is the same, uh, we are approaching in a different way, but the goal is different architecture, in many ways. Formal ways, program-wise, if you don't touch a, if your building don't touch a meta uh, level in the program or form or structure, it stays to be just a building. It's not architecture. So it's your turn. I shut up. Can I just say where we want to go with this? <coughs> <laughs> we, when he's showing images, they're images that deeply connect us. Whether it's uh, Bob Dylan or Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, if you name people that influence me, you have been my singular characters. Amazing, amazing. Um, not an athlete, but uh, somebody that was interested in massive social yeah. change. And, 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 and his boxing, if you understood him, was his delivery system. The way we use architecture as a delivery system for our political, cultural interests. We have all kinds of commonality. I, I, I should say again, it's something that hopefully will be very optimistic for you uh, as young people, um, that Asian architecture is um, very collegial. I mean, you're going to meet people that you're meeting right now in school, that many of them will stay with you, and you're going to meet people all your life, which have usually to do with your own formation. Because I'm, we're sitting here and it gives me an opportunity. This is unusual. That um, so we meet um, in 1989 and work on this project. They need to start. But here's a really incredible thing, actually. First, and how he works and how I work. And um, we've known each other for 30 years. And, and I'm going to tell you that uh, he's one of the people that that, that form it. But it's your your relationships, your conversations, your, your connections with people have hugely got to do with who you become as a as a human being, as well as an architect. Um, and it's funny, when we first worked together, um, we had developed this kind of an idea, and it was the first time we started digging the ground, and uh, the notion of the multiplicity of ground, and ground is, a, is an absolutely essential part to our architecture. And, um, and then we worked together, and he put this, you can see the piece he did, cuts right across, and he's, um, I recognized immediately that he not only cut across, but he cut across the most kind of sensitive part of the project, which had that massive kind of ability to fuck it up. And it was just absolutely clear what he was doing. And it was just startling to me. And it was the first time I got working with somebody that I realized that we had this common set of interests. But I'm coming from a very kind of highly, in my mind, rational position. He's coming from a very different um, open sketch with closed eyes. And he's going to work through the resolving of this thing that starts as an extremely broad, intuitive kind of sensibility. And then it's funny as I watch you today, and again, we've known each other for three decades, um, and it might be interesting to you as you're um, looking at kind of how you work and basically understand or, or attempting to understand um, your sensibilities and your um, various facilities, both artistically and intellectually, and how you're you're absorbing that self in, in your future work. And, and, and as I look at the, 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 the 
Wolf's work today, and again, I, I know it, so it's just, it's just refreshing, refreshing to me. Um, in my mind, um, it's very connected to this person as a very particular personality and somebody that has a, um, a very special facility that can do this. And I actually separate my architectural world that people can do this and people that require more structure. And I kind of divide my people I know architecturally so that uh, if you're talking about CISA, he does this. If you're talking about Frank Gehry, he does this, right? Um, if you're talking about the extreme opposite of Peter Eisen, absolutely kind of methodological and not can't, or a ram, can't even go on. No, no interest in that level. It's not about that kind of facility. And, um, but I'm really looking at your work and realizing, it, again, as you, as you make, as it's useful for you as you're developing, um, I'm still in formation and I'm much less secure in that kind of notion. And although I can do a little bit of this, um, I need structure and I need um, a method of, um, of, of an organizing system that's discursive that guides me. And it, 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 it comes, it produces a, a very different kind of set of circumstances, even if we have certain interests that are parallel having to do with, say, dyna dynamicism or a certain level of complexity or the notion of something that's unfinished and we could go on and on, the fragment, part whole. Like, I've been totally fascinated in reconstructing part whole, starting with the classical Renaissance notion, and I've reestablished the notion of part as an autonomous thing, and it happened very early on, and I was just stumbling my way forward to get clearer and clearer and work with it. And you share a bit of that, but mine's going to be much more kind of rigorous and specific in that area, and his is going to be just part of, in my mind, of kind of a definition of, of the work itself. But it, was, it seemed to me it might be interesting, because I always said work is so radically different, really, and, and I'm um, a very pragmatic character, um, and, and I, I can't escape that. But don't you think and that you're that, able That's also part of it. But the, the point being that it, it, um, it, if it's useful, it'd be somehow useful in you somehow identifying with your assessment, right, of your own capabilities and your interests, etc. What struck me when you were just talking is that you talked about the, competi the competition you entered together in LA, is that you talked about what, what you did intuitively by just striking through it. In a way, you know, that and the intuitive sketch is not that different as what you call chance. It's just achieved in a very different way, right? Like your interest now in chance is not very different than creating a random situation and then being forces for it, you know, or, or creating architecture around that. Do you see any parallels in, in the idea of chance versus the intuitive? Uh, I don't understand what chance is in this in this uh, content. Um, I, yeah. Okay. Tom has a very good eye, and I have a very good eye, and this is a quality architects seldom have. Yeah, they they use their brain, but they don't use their. Eye. And I always say, okay, we can discuss. Everything on the paper is only on the paper. But there is the moment when it's spilled, then we add, we have to add a fourth dim dimension, namely time. And only when you have stepped into the building, you have the right to criticize it. This is, yeah, looking at the, uh, at the images, yeah, which are faked or not, and whatever. It never gives you the real impression of what is happening in architecture. Yeah? But you and know, this is the same. It's important too that, that uh, I, I didn't choose, I chose very particularly sort of this, the set of views I have having to do with the three things I showed and, and interesting kind of organizing chance for you in a three dimensional graph and then showing a, a kind of a the, the use of modern technology, AI, to, to look at huge numbers of alternatives, which, which is attacking the human agency, the, 
traditional, it's actually attacking a woman. It's the singularity of this, of this person of huge facility. And it's trying to expand that in a, in a way that, that doesn't have just that intuitive notion. What, what I didn't talk about, which is maybe more evident as I look at your work, is I think it's maybe more useful in large scale projects. My class is here, I assume. The unicorn thing we looked at today, large scale urban project. Um, my organization method seems to be moving much more in terms of the, the usual language and being able to develop complex, large urban projects. And maybe it's finally going to find a place there that it's going to be much more useful than it is in architecture. And it'll have to do with organizing large scale um, uh, urban events where um, less and less is important between compositional ideas. And in fact, you're looking for the organization of complex, multifaceted systems. Because I'm interested in the relationship of locating the systems that make this complexity. And it's not, it's not compositional. In fact, if anything, the challenge of composition is not interested in composition. Right? I'm, I appreciate it, and I'm interested in, in, in other people's work, but that's not my personal kind of direction. But it's definitely more than for scale. You're going to agree to that, of course, yeah? Yeah, that, uh, it would be the wrong way to educate students starting with a big scale. Um, I think uh, it's a matter of age. I'm sorry to say that. And it's a matter of experience as well. When I was a young architect, my father was an architect, when he said, you will see, you don't have the experience, I got crazy. Uh, but now I think, OK, maybe he was right. And I wouldn't tell that every student, but some of them, they will understand. Meaning to decide, it's, it's fashion now that everyone makes a master plan, big scale things. Um, I don't think, I haven't seen, I always see bad master plans. Even the thing we are doing, I'm not satisfied because we are losing the scale in the moment we are thinking that it's a playground. <laughs> so, like I, I once saw Mr. As a man, we had a big discussion. Yeah, by the, by the way, there is a big cultural difference between the Anglo-Saxon culture and the, let's say, the European culture, because, speaking German, because in German, some, if I translate some English words into German, it makes no sense. And why? Vice versa. You know, I had a discussion about figure and ground with my friend uh, Peter Altman. No solution because he didn't understand what I was talking about and I didn't understand what he is talking about. Because figure and ground in German means really nothing. Yeah, figure and ground it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, soil and figure, whatever that means. I, I'd rather go for Gestalt. And to do a master plan, you have to know a lot. This is all I think. You cannot play rough. You are like the master plan. We, are, we, we, we just work it in the master plan. It's the most stupid thing in my life. As a famous architect. Because he didn't care about infrastructure. He didn't care about climate. He didn't care about um, Stadtraum, city space. He just made one building next to the other and maybe on a grid. This is not reliable and responsible in times we are living in. It's, it's, it's a serious topic, and, and it's not that easy that everyone, yeah, like in the school, I, I saw many master plans yeah, from the students of Sahel. One ashtray next to each other, and one vase next to each other. And uh, 
He was asking, do you know where North is? They had no idea. But that's the interesting point, because I would have uh, completely disagreed with your assessment. And that's precisely <laughs> the reason. I would have said urban planning, um, the is, development of the future yeah, of our the, cities is the singular problem for this group. And the architecture is secondary. It's not that it's not important. Mm -hmm. It will always be good architects. But the most compelling problems at this moment of time in the 21st century is our urban and infrastructural and it's precisely because there are so few ideas on the table. That there's, so, there's an inability both in terms of methodology and in terms of any kind of creative thinking that's even coming from a more intuitive kind of place versus understanding that comes from a rational kind of a place. That there's, there's an emptiness. And as we've been invited to many of these things, um, especially in, in China, um, it's been fascinating the um, the dearth of ideas is just startling, right? And the, um, in some cases, just about the complete irresponsibility that have to do with kind of very visual ideas that have absolutely nothing to do with today's problems in ecological terms, in social terms, in cultural terms, in infrastructure, go, go right through the list. And it seems as though that, um, and again, now my interest in, in, in multiple systems is, is going to be kind of is coming from this, 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 this set of desires, is um, an ability to deal with problems of that complexity. And I would have said that architecture as a discipline is just about hopeless in its, its ability to solve these kind of problems. And it's going to, um, if it doesn't make that change in, in a fairly short period of time, it'll be taken by some of the physical. Because it, it, is, it will be solved. There'll be people that are looking for answers. And, and it's why today, when you look at creative people, we talked about in our class bit today, uh, the people I'm most interested in are the Ian Musks. If you're looking at people that solve problems and solve them at the first principle level and, and have some sort of a combination of a, sniff, a sniffer or an intu intuition, kind of a sense, a hunch, and an ability to bring complex thinking, intricate thinking, to a problem. Um, and you can take, he came out of the school, by the way, um, and he can produce a rocket and beat Boeing. One guy, one person, right? And he just hires smart people. And they come from MIT and, and Caltech and then blah, 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 right? And he figures out how to, to make a, a more reliable, very big rocket. And, um, and he calls it um, BFR. He's so confident. He has such a great sense of humor. He calls it a big fucking rocket. That's his name. Right? Well, and, um, and, right and, what, and then I have to have this car. He does the same thing. <laughs> He thinks out, and, and the macro problem is um, health. And he knows that. He's solving health by taking in Los Angeles, they would be producing 45% of the contaminant of the air. We could go through the various cities and understand that. And that's the macro problem. And then way down the list of problems, and congestion, and we could go right through the infrastructure, way down is comfort or the performance of the car, or the look of the car, we're now down to four or five or six categories, meaning what we consider design, I would say, the architecture community, which starts with look, and I would say it's absolutely, completely irrelevant. And it's why you know, many of you will have a hard time getting a job if you can't change this, and it's why architects are where they are, because they're so limited in the way they can see problems in, in any macro sense, and they can find, and then it starts even with our community, there's so little coherency that it's hard to find five architects that can, that can talk together, that can locate common problems. There's an enormous problem today that we Sorry. have to solve if we're going to maintain the power of our discipline. Yes, I totally agree. And, and what I but we have to decide uh, the, to discuss the word complexity. Yeah, exactly. I heard it so many. If I hear it can so, I say something? Yeah, 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 please. Totally, yeah. because that's what I was going to get to. Like what struck me when I was looking at your early work, both of you, is that you both created objects that were ex no singularity. They were like extremely complex, but they were not necessarily important for the thing itself, but for what they created around them, what they actually started to disrupt or what they started to cause. And what struck me when I looked at your later work is that you're actually in a way still doing that, that your buildings are still 
highly complex structures that work on multiple levels, but that you also create, in a way, the city or the ground, as you could say, not you know, the ground as we, but the ground itself you also create as an object or as that same complexity. And you study what happens literally at that friction between the two. And I think that is a super interesting subject, like and the idea is object not as a singularity but as a complexity and the fact that the city is as much an object as the building or the architecture is and how they meet. And I think there is a big uh, difference in the sense with like both of you operate like that and the friction is more interesting in a way at most points than either one of them. Is that something you recognize? Because I think there is there is something in the beginning how you work that totally still is the driver of the same kind of looking for not the object itself, but how the object creates tension, friction, new conditions. And that, prag that pragmatic thing you are talking about is in a way what you're creating there. You know? Like you're looking for that thing to happen. You look for a different, completely different thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way yeah. The same. Okay. I would like to show you a master plan. Because I think that climate is not an easy game now. And we have to react and act in every move to be independent from the old resources. So we have a company. I can predict if someone says, OK, we want to have a. a this is the area for a city. We can tell them whether they have geothermic energy. We can tell them how bad the air is, whether it's good or not. We can, of course, the wind and the sun, the, all this is visible. But the invisible is geothermic and the bad air. You know that a lot of people die because they are living in the areas with bad air. And for instance, this museum in Jintai, we, we, we have two towers which are cleaning, uh, has a bad, very bad air there, cleaning the air and blowing it into the building. Yeah? So clean air is the goal. So I want to show you how, what's the master of the master plan when we start to do it. I hope. Yeah. Of course it's a dynamic master plan. Air, sun, geothermic that defines the situation of a building. Of course there are three dimensional things. And I'm dreaming to build such a thing sooner or later. So it's going up in the air three dimensional. It's not only on the ground, but it's three dimensional. And the argue is the argument is that um, we can save energy and produce energy by buildings. Yeah? This is the back thought. So th therefore, I say, OK, the infrastructure is very important. The investigation, where to build the things. You know, people, the autocrats came to us, OK, this is good. Uh, this, I bought just this land. Yeah? Make something out of it. <laughs> and then in Cheddar, for instance, we, had a, uh, we have a project in Cheddar. In Cheddar, yeah, he said, OK, we, we need a kind of new city core or whatever. But we need 3,000 or 4,000 departments, a rather big. So we went to old Cheddar and studied all the intelligent, intelligent moves the old city has embedded. Yeah? How they are uh, directed to the wind, how they have balconies that the poor women can call. They are not allowed to go down, uh, so they must be in the 
the reach of calling the kids of the plazas and so forth. It's very clever. I was, of course, if you have a bottle of water on the balcony, it will not help you to cool it down <laughs> like it was uh, centuries ago. So we have to transplant it into contemporary language of architecture. I was very proud that we are, uh, have an argument taken from the old times. I never did it before, but I was very proud of that. And the Sheikh said, great project, great project. I really want to build it, but I have to tell you that our people now, they want to live in 300 meter high glass towers. They want to see the, the sea and the desert. And I asked them, I asked him, and what will you do in 30 years when your resources are running out? Will the glass towers be a new department of Kentucky Fried Chicken? And he said, I don't care what happened in 30 years. Let me ask you, something we talked about earlier, and I was very much focused on um, care where we are at this moment in our career, because we're both in the four decade territory. And um, I, I guess I'd like to ask a question that's connected to something I'm interested in. Um, would it have to do with the changes in your thinking from the kind of formation of the roof to the current work you're looking at and the, the nature of what has changed in very fundamental ideas of architecture for all of society, starting even with something as basic as its physical presence. Because both of us definitely had in common in the beginning. We were fighting architecture as a cultural practice and struggling with the, uh, the pragmatism within a capitalist system that has nothing to do with the art of architecture and the culture of architecture. And we were, we were fighting for that. So the little pieces you saw were elements that I was struggling to make a claim of my investment in, in architecture as a cultural form. I had absolutely no interest in the cafe. Whatever the program was, it was completely born. I had no interest in it whatsoever. And, um, and the struggle was to make it work, to get it built and to even deal with a client and to get through that. And they had no interest in the client, right? And they knew, and it was very clear. So it was just literally a struggle to have a practice, right? And to keep it going. And then it definitely was much more, I would have said, more difficult in this culture than in Europe. And then here we are in a much more complicated situation with the right management. But it, but it definitely separated. It's one of my first projects at the show was in Austria. And it's still one of my almost open projects. And I go, damn. I can stay in Austria. This is where I want to practice architecture, not in LA. So you both But let me ask you, because, because I would have said that certain things have changed. And I, I, the image I showed of the, the multiple, the 100 screens, that should worry you. I showed you 60,000 hours of work in each of those. And I'm going to have 20 of them. Right? It's going to be years of man hours in that project. That should worry you. Because I'm going to be able to do these projects, and I'm already there. I'm within a year, and I'm now bringing in math types out of MIT because I need I need AI stuff, not design stuff, because it's about methodology. And I'm going to be able to look at massive alternatives and be getting more and more complex the amount of information I can generate, and I can now give performance directions to each of those schemes and look at them in terms of where I want to focus them, and. Um, it's AI. I need one person, right? And um, I now have an office of, um, I don't know, somewhere around 80, 90 people. It would be easily 300 10 years ago. Easy, right? And the models you see, there's no people. It's made out of the way you make them, I assume, I don't know, right? And um, it's moving in that direction. And it should be, um, and I'm aware of that. And I'm way at the end of my career or whatever, etc. and you're beginning your career. And I'm going to tell you that uh, this is going to be the future. There's no question. That more and more of the work will be augmented. It will never take away the sense of your own creative being. That's not a problem. And it'll, it'll, it'll be some hybridization of that. But a lot of the mechanics, a majority of the mechanics, um, if I showed you the first
first models we did, I had interns coming in for the summer. The whole summer was a model for three people. And they were beautiful fucking models, right? But it was the summer for three people. Today it's in a machine, and it's, it's a machine that operates with one person kind of, kind of playing around with it a couple hours a day. And they're, they're models that are so much more complex, et cetera, and they're made, they're made in a couple of days, right? And it's going to continue that. But then with that would be, I think, um, so part of it is the, the technique and you know, how we're going to develop kind of ideas. And it should be something you're concerned with because it's your future. And the other one would be the whole rule of architecture and how it starts. And again, I'm going to go back to the must conversation. What is the role of an automobile society? And how does it affect the nature of your role as a designer? Because it affects even the need for a physical thing. And clearly, we're living in a world where we're moving from physical objects, which architecture are about, right, traditionally, and um, virtual, digital worlds that now operate and do those things. And if it came up on our class today, that as you start a project today, it would be fair to discuss it, um, you, get no, you, get, you get normal kind of projects, and it's a high school on a, a three-acre site on a hill in a city, and you go to work. It doesn't work that way today. The first question you ask is, how does architecture participate in education? It might not be a building. In fact, the direction is, is moving away from the building, or it might have nothing to do with an autonomy of a school. It might be absolutely connected to some other cultural institution, right? And, those are the kind of issues that we're facing today, which absolutely challenges the whole role of what architects do. And locating the physical, as I would say, would be one of the most kind of important kind of notions of kind of how we locate our work within that. And again, it would go directly to, that, to, to the, the Tesla in terms of the, the, the role of design. And it's seen more and more strategically. You still have the object. You still have the person developing an object. And there's an autonomy to that. There's a culture to that. There's no question. I'm not challenging that it's going to go away. But it's, it's, it's changing kind of radically. And I think it becomes much more tactical, much more strategical. And it's something that people in my classes here will talk about this semester. But it's something that I think today you have to have a stronger role of the nature of your work within broader terms, cultural, political, social, et cetera. Right? That it's not possible to operate. Um, when we started, when I started, totally naive. I'm a designer, I'm completely connected to the physical world, to my objects that I produce. Incredibly naive, incredibly kind of overly optimistic, and I'm just doing my work, trying to move forward, whatever that means, and we're the same that way. And I couldn't be more naive. Couldn't do that today. I couldn't start. I would, we agree on that. We couldn't do what we did. With this generation, impossible. And it was a support mechanism. And it was also a particular time with the Ali's and the Jimi Hendrix. And we could go through a list of characters that were taking place in the film and, and music and, and art world and philosophy that was part of the milieu at that time. And it was a unique kind of period in the world that at the end of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And we were, we were able to kind of move along with that and use that force. Right? And, and have a constituency, that's, that's gone. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's part of I history. I have to say, work-life balance was not in our mind. <laughs> At all. Oh. At all. Uh, tell you the truth. My students used to talk about work-life balance all the time. I never heard that before. Uh, young people came to me and said, OK, um, it's 6 o'clock, I want to go to meet my girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, sure. I said, why? He said, because I worked it out. So this is, a, 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 this is very different. I appreciate that, but it's not my style, to be honest. I wanted to say that sometimes I have the feeling I'm much more pragmatic than Tom is. And Tom is much more emotional. His approach is much more emotional than mine. Yeah. And the other thing is, I want to know what. And this is I have problems with the word complexity. 
you use it in a very different way than we uh, German talking people are using. So this is a, uh, I have to find out what you meant with complexity. Complex is many things together, not only talking about the building cannot be complex. Complex is a society. Complex well, is a So I understand it. Complex is a society when, uh, when she uh, when the society mean, wants to wants to get a solution for a problem. Uh -huh. To me, a storm is an easy, you kind of overly simple an answer. And, and it happened to be somebody I met in my life, a Christian to do, and he's an evolutionary biologist. And I would start with evolutionary biology, and I would start with a kind of notion of reality, with the interconnection of, 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 of human life, both flora and fauna. And then you could, it, it, there's an absolute clear notion for architects that, that it'll be biological. And, and, and probably a lot of you are already kind of sniffing that, or that's already just normal to you. Right. And then we see things as radically interconnected in, in, in a world that saw things as isolated. And that started, of course, at the end of the 19th century, right? And was already in full swing with, with, with artistically with the Picassos and the Duchamps and with the Einsteins and with the, the Freuds and we could go on and on. It started with Darwin. And, uh, and it's just been a continuing process of, of seeing the world as radically interconnected. And as architects and as urban designers, that's highly kind of a, a useful kind of beginning of a conceptual framework. Before and that's exactly what we do. We deal with the world that can only be seen and, and, con and connected within, again, a broad series of categories. Right? Not just connected in formal terms, connected culturally, socially, politically, etc. For me, complexity is how our brain is working. Oh, well, that's one thing. No, this is the complex. The, the brain, how our brain is working, is always a problem. This is very complex. You know, we, our brain is not organized. I know that because a friend of mine, Bob Singer, is a neurologist. Yeah, thank you. Uh, brain, and he is concerned with working on the brain since. <laughs> no more. And our brain is not organized hierarchic-wise, nor is it organized democratic-wise. It changes this, uh, the organization according to the problem. And this, if we can do that as architects, then I would say we are complex thinkers. I don't know whether the architecture is complex then. What we are doing, and I think this is uh, what, we, what, what, what is concerning me a lot, we give architecture a life. And it's just a building. It cannot move, it cannot change. Yeah, we try to, to do that. But it's not a lively organism. So therefore, it cannot be complex in my understanding of complex. You got a problem with your understanding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, you guys, I know that you the, think that you are the, the one uh -huh. and only. The English language is the, the most important language in the architectural theory. Then you are, uh, then you are right. But the other way of thinking, I can prove that this thinking coming from the Roman culture. The Romans were a mercantile military culture. And the Renaissance as well really is mirrored in your culture and in our culture. See, this is one place where I completely disagree. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, are completely embedded in your own synthetic invented possibilities that are part of the organism in your brain. And you operate and you do this, and it's singular, and you're a completely whole person in that sense. I'm a partial person and don't have either an interest or capability of doing that. And I 
I like the scientific community need mechanisms and operational systems that are parallel to um, hollow, where I can only see the world in an advanced way with no, a mechanism, that, way, that, that, that mechanism that advances my limited notion of both synthesizing and observing. And I need systems that are going to directly what I was talking about. I need systems that allow me to produce something beyond my own imagination. And at this point in my life, I'm only interested in things that I can't imagine. If I can imagine it, it's basically a story. And it's operating. This is a misunderstanding. So I have to clarify that. Of course. I'm not, no, no, no. I'm not talking that I know everything and my brain is doing it. Uh, I, I think we need, in the future, we need a team. But like every football team, you have to follow some rules and regulations. Some people are better in, uh, in defense, some are better in, in the forward game, some people are better. Yeah, we, you understand that? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. missed that in the beginning, by the way. I, was, I, I forgot that one. When we first met uh, yeah. in, in, in L.A., um, I remember exactly the conversation we had over lunch or dinner. And one of the things we, 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 we had in commonality is we didn't use our names. Yeah. To interrupt horses. And immediately, we located the source, yeah. and it was Archigram. And it was Super Studio. And at the time, Rolling Stones. You, you coming to the AA, me, they were teaching at UCLA. They were the first people to teach you there. And I was skipping out of my fifth year of school, which I found a little long asking, and showing up at UCLA. And I met Aaron and Cook and Shock and Green and that whole gang. I was completely carried away with them. And absolutely, the collective nature of the work, not singular, and the notion yeah. of, of a name that doesn't connect to that singularity of an idea, the challenge is that was one of the first things we talked about that we had in common. I mean, and it both was located with the archigram voice. And then it kind of died away for years, and now I guess it's a common thing. Right? But that connected notion is super, super important. And again, I don't know how you guys talk about it, but the, the, for us, it's, a, it's not a singular act. And it, meaning that it's very connected discourse, and both at an emotional, a non verbal level, that makes sense, and a verbal level. Some of it is very complicated, like there would be in any art form. And you just, uh, it'd be like Keith Jarrett, anyway, uh, with, with this trio. You can't talk about it. You just have to feel it, right? If you listen to their Blue Note, <laughs> you know the Blue Note series, the, the three of them playing? One of the most amazing pieces ever produced. You know, one more. You cannot separate the three of them. And there's an agreement conceptually that they're playing percussion instruments, right? Because he understands the piano is a percussive instrument. And there's times you literally cannot differentiate a piano, a bass, and a drum. It's so incredible, right? And there's that kind of communication. But anyway, the point being, there was an early agreement that architecture is a collective creative act. Yeah. Right? And um, one of my role models, um, according to the team uh, playing, uh, was, you know, that. But two mountain climbers who climbed uh, Mount Everest in, without oxygen. And one of them was a very good, was very good on, on, on rocks, and the other one was very good on ice, climbing on ice. Do you understand what? Yeah? Okay. okay. So the lead for when they were climbing rocks. <coughs> This guy took over, and the other one went in his eyes. So therefore, they were very, we call it überschlagen Gretel. Therefore, they were very fast, and therefore, they were very safe, uh, safer than the other, which said, oh, I do everything by myself. This is what we learned, yeah, and I'm missing my partner. He checked out because of health problems. Missing him very, very hard, yeah. Like I miss uh, um, Green, we made, I'm trying to think of this. I, I thought about before we did this uh, on the way here, um, my last, wherever I was, um, that it seemed like a kind of interesting opportunity. And, and I was also kind of concerned with these kind of two guys talking to young people. What do we have to say that's actually useful to you guys? 
But I was really thinking, maybe that's a connection to us, that it would be more of a question to you. Um, we were both incredibly affected by other artistic characters. And speaking of the Keith Sherrins, and whether it's a Miles Davis or whether it's a Truffaut or a, 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 a Fellini or whatever, and, and, and whether they were carried, whether it's a Muhammad Ali or whether it was a Martin Luther King or Che Guevara, there was an enormous influx, and I would have said, um, and I think I'm going to speak for this guy, I would have said it's more important than our text. I was, I was eh, obviously, I'm going to pick on Bruin, like they're all looking at the people that you're supposed to look at. Mm -hmm. If I'm straight about it, uh, yes, I did it, and, and I stole as much as I could steal and, and use things that were interesting or, or challenging or whatever. But the things that really influenced me were these other areas. And I'm thinking when I look at the audience and say, you're Keith Jarrett, and, and, and so I don't even have to say, you know, Dante Jeanette or Peacock, there's two other guys. I would have said, um, there's one thing you do here, you go out and get the album and start with Desert Sand. It's 26 minutes, and it takes about 12 minutes to warm up before they're leaving in a, in a group, etc. Um, see what it does to you. Because I'm going to say, I still listen to it. I've heard it thousands of times, and I, I play it for both of my young kids they grew up. First piece of music they learned to hear, etc. And I thought it was the most important thing possibly they could learn to do in terms of creating, stimulating the brain in a creative sense. And again, I think that would be a, something that it was absolutely essential to our growing up, right, as architects. And it had huge influence on the world. Because it, it, it gave it the characteristics that you so strive for in terms of the dynamicism and the openness and all the kind of agile stuff you're going to use if you describe the work. You don't have to. It's, it's like a good piece of music, you have to say nothing about it. You can show the work and say nothing. The words were done with it. Yes, I would have said everything that this man does is clear by the work. It, it requires absolutely no verbal thing whatsoever. It's only and now we're interested if for some reason you want to have a discourse about it. He said everything he had to say through the work, and I've always felt the same thing. If it's the work that I'm interested in, or that I can produce that, that I think is somehow interesting, that there's no reason to talk about it any more than there would be talking about the trio I'm talking about. He said, they've said everything they have to say. And, and, and it's the it's the example of a true Gazam Kinsper. And it's um, finger spits of Gekula in your language. It's a combination of the, the, the soul, I the spirit, I and, and the intellect combined. What? Finger spits? Finger spits of Gekula. Ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, it, it translates into a sentence. But it's the intellectual and yeah. emotional sense that's finger spits of coming out of your finger. It's, it's Beethoven or Bach. Right? It's an amazing concept. But, but it, again, I, I would think it would be, be more like asking questions. That it's super important today that, you're, that architecture is a result of huge numbers of influences that trigger you. And we're all different. Different influences will trigger you in different ways. And to, to consolidate it, I think, is really hopeless. Yeah. That it uses those influences. So that now talking can, that, that, that that spatialize. Yeah. Or, or make within formal terms, yeah. right? Yeah. Materialize so You went both through this massive storm, right? Like of music and all that stuff going on. And I, I looked at the dates. You know, you started both your office, 70s, early 70s. And it, you, for like 10 to 15 years, you did a huge amount of work directly related to those kind of things you just described, both of you. And, um, you know, money-wise, obviously, investment, but a lot of competitions, a lot of talking between each other. F just for the benefit of the students and us, younger architects who are still in that phase, maybe, how do you feel did you make the transition to, you know, becoming uh, an office that now suddenly deals with bigger issues? You're talking about environment, you're talking about cities. You know, you're talking about a different way of attacking cities or attacking buildings. Where do you feel in your careers was that switch where you went from uh, the smaller, I'm part of culture, into now I'm actually uh, we're, making we're life 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 life. Life. Uh, if, What? If there's characters that you have, then if you don't have it, you should just leave the room right now, is uh, tenacity and resilience. Huge. Because you're going to go bust, things are going to happen that would drive anybody, any sane person that would move away from a profession, right? Um, I had something that happened to me um, 
there it does set one line in the, in the pole, one pattern in the painting, uh, piece in the music was done or was done unconsciously. And this unconscious part rules the whole text, the painting, the music piece, whatever. So we were very firm with that. We, we didn't believe that the, uh, manipulating the shape and destroying something, that's the way of the really meaning of the, being deconstructed is there. So therefore the, uh, we try to expand our language in drawing uh, with eyes closed and things like that to, to figure out. And with this exhibition, we got the self-confidence and said, okay, we go ahead. We can build everything and we can use this method as a strategic tool to stay by the topic we said when we were young, we have to change architecture now and radically. We, we made an error, it, it doesn't work the way now, but radical, I think we proved that it could be changed. <laughs> yeah, you could say that that show was actually the first time that put people together that necessarily didn't call themselves something. Mm -hmm. um, the show had the title, but no one else had to identify by it, but it was still an amazing exhibit that just, I think you could say that the show itself was deconstructivist. No? The combinations were amazing. The, the people involved. This was a show for the younger uh, people, and you, that was in Roma. In you were not born at this time. This is like eighties, <laughs> right? Late eighties. Yeah, like late eighties, and uh, it put people together internationally. That at that point, maybe we're talking to each other, or sometimes not. But it was an incredible. And the great thing was not so much that the show was called the Circus, but the discussion you just mentioned that people were like, we are not the deconstructivists, we're still in the show, and they would still show up, and they still <laughs> would work up. Uh, and other people were, and that discussion was actually what was the most uh, productive, the, the discussion about what is this deconstructivist, and are you and are you not. So actually the fact that the title caused a huge dialogue was the real um, yeah. thing. But on that note, I would love to hear a little bit from you guys, are there any questions? What do you think? Do you want to know how anyone here thinks about a specific subject you're wondering about? And I have a microphone I can give to you. Or you have a microphone. That's different methodologies to approach um, permutations in design. Um, where do you see that fitting into a, a sort of cultural context beyond just the formal? Um, and how do you think it relates to the history of a place? Maybe you question on Vienna and Vienna. In Vienna. Um, I lost. Uh, what was the question? Uh, yeah, but sorry. The connection of our, our cultures. No. Um, Vienna and LA. Is that it? Yeah, well, no, not your culture specifically. Cultures of the projects you work on and how it relates between your two method uh, methodologies. Uh, yeah. uh, I think I believe in the simultaneity in systems. I don't believe in just one direction. So everybody is right, but nothing is correct. So when the, you know, when the television starts, the culture of television starts, everyone said, movies out. Now we have both. Yeah? We needed the cinema centers, the cinema theaters are going down. They have to invent new approach so that people come to the movies again. But it's a it's not a balance, but existing both. 
you can read a book and you can read it on the screen of your computer. Both is possible. And this is the way we, with the, the influence of, I, I really felt at home because I was taught, I had a very good teacher in the Undertaker University in Vienna. He was asking us, as students, this generation, to do models, physical models. Because this is my, my, uh, my teaching as well. I say architecture is a three-dimensional language, and we have to talk in three dimensions. Yeah? If I look at the rendering, I can believe it or not. If I look at the model, I can see whether it's true what the guy is telling me. Yeah. So, uh, and when I came to LA, I, feel, I felt immediately at home because when I visited the office of Frank, Frank Gehry, his office, and Eric Moss' office, I saw there were a lot of models, like in our studio. When I went to the British uh, architecture, German architects, there were no models, just presentation models. So I felt very home and I brought things back to Vienna. And maybe we were talking a lot about how we can do that. At that time, the models really work. Yeah. We were very clear about that. Yeah. Right? And that was the output of our creative energy. Right? It was the, the, the creative capital. It was, it was, and we were less and less concerned with this completely built it. Yeah. True. That's another whole conversation that maybe yeah. with you people that if you really, um, we were actually either yeah. ambivalent or not concerned whether it was built or not. We were Did I idea. answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I am. Say, Mazo Manos, more or less, please. <laughs> Um, you touched on this a little bit where on um, if you can do like start a practice today the way that you did a long time ago, um, maybe even considering the difference between doing that in LA versus Vienna. So one question I have, you know, it's after school, you know, does it matter today more than before where you start a practice? Um, there was some talk about the excitement of the music and the culture in the United States, but you know, I'm curious, like, did Vienna have something to offer you um, and your partners in particular, and how, like, how does that change today in terms of how one can start a practice after uh, school? and 
when I when I get back to Vienna and started to run the Angewandte, the, the architecture department, I invited all these guys to teach there, to come over there, to so, uh, there's no difference. But I have to say just to make it clear what the difference in culture was important. When I came back from the uh, States to Vienna, taking over the school, I was ready to make a review. In German, in, in Austria, in Germany, and in Swiss, they had only correction. Yeah? So when I said, OK, I want to invite people and discuss. give me money to discuss the things. They ordered, like Holland, this guy said, why do we need other architects? We are the best one. You understand? There was no discussion. Teacher was the guy who said, good or bad. There was no open discussion. And I'm very, I have to be honest, I'm very proud. I introduced yeah. the culture of review yeah. in Austria. So they didn't uh, give me money, so I paid all my friends the economy class flights, all free, because I pay, paid it by myself. And everyone came, it was very interesting. Yeah. So the connection, and I believe that LA and Vienna is connected in a subconscious way. What plus 10 is in Vienna is minus 10 in LA. And it's very, what he is talking about, I can respond in a very negative way as well. Because it's so strange, so foreign. Because one of the things that connects you to Los Angeles is that, because um, I would have said you came quite formed as you showed up, is that LA is the place um, where yeah. the characters you name are always in formation. And there's a question whether there's ever a arriving at some conclusion. And, uh, and especially, literally, all the people you name, um, all of us are constantly looking for something and we seem to want. There's a question whether we arrive, and there's even less of an interest in the arrival. Right? And that's absolutely a connection that you, you picked up like this. What is the source or method that you take to continue evolving in this field? To be specific, to be awake and aware of your surroundings, environment, and society and problems. Is it through reading, traveling, or meeting people? Like, how do you continue to evolve? Because you said you spend 80% of your time in practice. Like, is it the other 20%, or is it always in your thinking? Can you give me your uh, telephone so that I can read your question?
implicit notion that I'm not finished. I'm not practicing now and I'm consumed with a fairly large amount of work. That I'm, um, I'm actually the most interested in, in generating kind of the next level of ideas and then reinvigorating the work that's in the practice that's at the present time. And um, there's, no, there's no kind of end place, there's no, there's no end to this, this kind of issue. And, and if it's anything, it's um, I'm interested at this point in my life, I'm 75 years old, in, in kind of reinventing certain things and, and culminating certain researches that I've been involved with for well over a couple of decades. And um, it is purposeful for you as young people that it's, it's, it's something that's continuing. Right? And definitely in, in, in the academic work, um, it allows the, the time to experiment free of contingency of all the demands, which are um, can be overwhelming. It'll be your largest, um, you can ask all the other faculty, the most difficult part of your practice will be dealing the contingent with, with the, uh, the, the reality of architecture in pragmatic terms. And I don't mean that in any negative way. I couldn't think of anything that was more rewarding than this profession, so I'm not in any way being negative about this. Uh, but it is the reality. And then you have to be understanding that and be realistic about it, right? As, as young people. And, and then at that level, a really a weird combination, I think, is that we also share a kind of a, a, an opti a critical optimism and a naivete in, in that you can only have in your 20s and 30s that it's, it's very difficult to maintain. Uh, when you hit 40, and now you have to work at it to keep that kind of spirit or that um, a certain um, kind of naiveness that, that's necessary, I think, to think about things and be open to new ideas before they get shut down by reality, contingency. Right? And anyway, ask any of your, your people that are, that are 40 years old. As you're practicing, and um, somehow to maintain um, your creative drive requires a, a, a kind of a unique um, optimism and, and kind of a sensibility that you, you, you you're aware of and you can maintain. That it's it's a it's a project in a way. You agree with that, right? Because it's very easy to get cynical. It's very easy to get very angry. You go through those phases also. Where, can't say that you don't go through that. I mean, you, you get yourself out of it. Um, it's funny, I always go to, I reread uh, pieces of a biography by, uh, by uh, Usan. And he got, he got kicked out of Sydney. And I go, OK, uh, I'll never be that bad. I'm OK. <laughs> right? And you want to see the absolutely most horror story that kind of destroyed the character also. I mean, they literally booted him out of the city. It was the most nasty thing, and they blamed him for everything, like they blame architects for everything. That's not what they do. And um, read that, and then it'll put you back on your feet again. You know, okay, I'm all right. <laughs> let's, let's go at it, right? <laughs> was, was your question who is making the decision? Sorry? What's your question? Um, who is who is making the decision? I guess no? my question was more about how to navigate like present and future going into this field. Because I'm curious as to what we can do after we leave school um, and how to stay naive and how to keep our creativity and also interest in, in our communities and society. Um, so that was my question. So I stay with the answer. Oh. Okay, last question over there. Actually, I do the decision in my life. Um, I guess my question is um, about an article that came out over the summer by Patrick Schumacher, who kind of introduced that there's this disconnect between the architectural discourse and the architectural practice today. Um, he had perhaps a few of his own individual solutions to how we can start to address that today. 
Um, and I was just curious, because it is a pressing matter for all of us to kind of consider is what, in your, both of your opinions, like what would you say is something that education systems and academia today needs to kind of like do in order to bridge that disconnect? Oh, you are talking about parapetric. Yeah, but he was the first who, who disconnected the theory from real architectural life, yeah? And now we is in trouble. Since Saha is not alive anymore, he has troubles. I agree that the education, I don't know about your school, but uh, I agree that the education is not perfect. No one is perfect. I don't know how I should handle students who come to our office and when it goes to, the, to, to be pragmatic in terms of knowing what the ground plan is for and knowing what the section is for and how to organize a building. I have to say, all our buildings they don't look like that, but they are very well organized. Therefore, we have a lot of visit visitors there. Yeah, if you see your, wherever we are doing, even in the apartment houses, people are happy. So, if they don't know what it means, a building should uh, look like, uh, should look towards north or south, then he has trouble in our office. So the ground education, the, 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 the things you have to know, why, not discussing the, the, the working method, but organize a building in the right way, meaning that you know that um, what for an elevator is and how it should be used and things like that. Mm -hmm. To know the, 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 the tools, yeah? the hammer and the nail, then you can fantasize. If you know, if you are secure that you know the, the, the width of an aisle, if you are secure, it's no problem to draw that. Yeah? You understand? So and I'm missing that very much. In, uh, in our office, I don't, we don't have, yeah, we take renderers. Yeah? But by the way, I have to say, oh, what I think, uh, how an office of an architect will look like in 10 years, Two guys who can draw plans, two, and eight guys who are making renderings and animation. Because my experience is that the clients nowadays, they don't look, they don't understand, they just want to see some moving parts. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah, very sh short, yeah? And if they from Disney, they want to see how a shopping mall is working. They don't care about uh, uh, construction. If they see some things like that, they say, oh, you, maybe you can build it, but it's very expensive. This is the, the, this is the attention span of the future development plans. They want to know the efficiency and the price of the building. Nothing else is important. So maybe your education is going the right way, meaning working on the computer, making beautiful pictures. <laughs> yeah, I will see. I will see. I will see. No, no, no. This is my experience when people come from overseas and what to work in our office. But I, I understand the, the, the disconnect between practice and academic. Yeah, the disconnect. Oh, I think it's an incredibly complicated uh, issue. And that one of the problems today is the, uh, it comes with a mis-
can't see your face anymore. Um, that the um, that with the um, less numbers of practicing architects as your instructors. Whoa. Yeah. Put a black slide on eyes right on my face. <laughs> Sorry. Why don't you put a slide? Yeah. Just one.
cases where you're in a very raw, civil, early culture that, that, that doesn't have the history of a Vienna, or, or even a, 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 new, a new history of Japan, right? That is highly cultured, and, and we're, we're a, different, a different place. There are great formations there, right? But I would think it started with it, um, being much more aggressive about your own future and um, kind of what you see are the opportunities and looking very realistically at your education and the delta you see between wherever you want to go and um, your education. Right? And, it's, yeah. and the passivity is absolutely deadly. Right? It requires your, your energy. It seems to me, I think it'd be a good time to students on Again, we grew up in a time where students maybe even argued too much power, and we kind of took over things. And, and again, that's one place being American we can be very proud of. Um, my generation showed us not to go to war. So when we're called on the war, we say we're not going. Uh, and um, we had an unusual time in history where it was accepted that I had a voice when I was 18, 17 years old. And I had, so I had a powerful voice, and I, um, I responded to it. I got it, and it made sense, right? And again, given, I think, our generation, let's say, um, we'll joke about you guys, but I don't know, kind of went the day. We went through, and it's not a negative way at all. But because we, we came into this kind of very particular time, and the young people had a voice. And you, you were listened to, and you were also working collectively together for agreed upon ambitions, culturally, politically, etc. And there were agreements of what we, this where we were going. It may be happening more in the gender conversation today. There's certain, you know, in certain environmental, there are connected issues taking place today, politically, culturally, etc. It seems like um, one of the things I'm looking Return guys, let's let's ramp it up now. Um, if you see the problem, solve it. Don't expect anybody to solve it for you. And uh, we were joking today. Um, however old you are, whether you're 18 or whether you're 25, you're not going to get any smart people. You are who you are. You get your more experience and uh, use your intelligence to do what it takes to make things more uh, operational. I think your potential. I think that uh, the schools are a very important transfer point of knowledge. Right now, more than ever before, because we are living now, our, our world is on a very uncertain pace. It's wobbling. You cannot feel what's going on because the old structures are going to die. They are not dead yet, but they're going to die. So imagine a platform, and these are the old structures. They are going down. They are going to die. The new structures, they are not born yet. They're coming up. So the schools on this uncertain ground can develop ideas in which level ever, which could influence and give power to the new structures. So I'm very optimistic if you, as young guys, define a new kind of architecture you want to build or you want to think about or whatever, to build could be my favorite thing. Not, I don't like architecture only to read. So, uh, so you have the chance to develop new ideas which could influence the reality and maybe the, this reality, upcoming reality, works better than the old structures. Maybe. But don't let the old structure go, uh, structures going down and being reaper, uh, reborn. reborn. Don't let that happen. This is my advice. So therefore, take the possibilities the school is giving you and develop the, your own competence about what you want to do as an architect. So therefore, I don't give press 